thank you very much. Um, firstly, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, it was not very nice out there, quite cold. Obviously, it's a, it's a good opportunity to yourself to enter. Give you a bit of insight in terms of the way that we work, what we're trying to do, and what we're trying to see happen over short and the rest of the season and beyond. Um, I'll be honest, we, we didn't really know what to do, so there's an element of we're going to go into lots of detail and we're going to go into lots of ta tactical and technical detail. So, there may be elements of it that maybe interest you, maybe, maybe elements that you don't really care too much about, but we're trying to obviously cater for an audience where it's it, it's quite sparse. So. We're going to go through some some detail. Um, we'll take you through the slides. Tim will take you through some technical stuff. Um, and then we'll have a, a sort of answer and questions at the end. So quick quick agenda. So we've got a few questions, sort of icebreaker questions, a little bit about us. Um, I'll take you through very quickly some of the management structure and what the different roles and responsibilities are. We'll show you quickly what a typical week might look like. Um, I think it'll be quite interesting in terms of the amount of contact and the amount of detail that goes into that week. We'll have a look at a little bit more of a dive into a couple of those areas of detail. So you'll actually see what the players receive and how, how they receive that sort of information to prepare for games. Tim will take us through some of our principles of play, sort of strategies around how we want to play, what our aims are, what our objectives are. We'll then delve into some stats of the season so far. Um, thanks very much for Chris Watts, who's pulled a lot of it together. Um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. I, I do, I really like data, so we'll, we'll go through that. Um, and then we've got a bit of a new sign and reveal for you, 24 hours in advance. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take you through, um, obviously a new sign in as well, and then we'll have a, an open forum Q&A. Anything's off the table. Um, try and be a bit, little bit nice. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and answer any questions you've got as openly as and honestly as we can. Um, mm. But yeah, that's that's the plan. Um, mm. Probably when we're working through the first sort of elements of, of the detail, if you can try and hold any questions and keep until the end, I'm just really conscious that there's probably quite a lot to go through just because, again, we wanted to make sure that everyone gets something out of it. That seem okay? Yeah. Okay, so a little bit about us. I'll let Tim go first, because I've set him up a little bit with this one. <laughs> so, Tim, do you want to tell everyone what team you support? Oh, what a terrible start this is for me, then. I am, unfortunately, a Bolton fan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and it's not a joke either. <laughs> I think I might actually be worse. I'm an Everton fan. <laughs> yeah, so... Oh. I know. So at least now you've got to be nice to us for the rest of it. <laughs> First and best football memory. Yeah, I think um, as a kid, I had a season ticket at Bolton. For those in the room who remember Burnham Park, I was there every other week in away games as well. So that, that was my first memory. Um, in terms of best, I think it probably comes in coaching. So before this... Um, I was in America managing a U23 team and we, we had a game against the national team um, at home. Sold out stadium, amazing. Um, and we ended up winning the game, which at the time was kind of really big headlines. So that's, that's probably my best experience. Maybe. So, <laughs> so first was, was my dad taking me to Goodison Park. It was for, for the derby back in... 1987, I think it was. Um, and yeah, it, it, that sort of feeling, I think when you walk up the terrace and you, you first get exposed to that noise and it's like the wind and the noise and sort of itching in the face, that was sort of my first experience. Um, in terms of best, um, I think from, other than getting the Berry job, um, I think the day where we won the FA Vars at Wembley was just an unbelievable experience. Um, it just it just went too fast. But other than that, it was it was... Outside of my daughter being born is probably the best experience I've had. Um, so I started quite young. I think at the point where I realised, um, kind of normal really, went through different academies and got released just before professional. 
at that point was figuring out what I wanted to do in my life, didn't really have a clue. Um, and as part of a college course, I went back to my local school and doing some coaching. Absolutely terrified. It was the worst session you could ever imagine. <coughs> um, but at that point, I decided that it was something that I loved. Um, so yeah, I started coaching at 17, um, which I know people start younger now, but when I started, that, that was really young at that point. Um, yeah, so that's when I did. Uh, for myself, I, I think it was more, it was probably a lot later. So it was probably coming towards the end of of playing. Um, I was at Witness at the time in the Northwest Counties, and um, we had a, a a man who coached us, like called Steve Hill. Um, and the way that he interpreted and saw the game, it, it inspired me as a sort of more senior player. Um, and it was only when I started talking to him around more detail around tactics and different ways of looking at the game. It made me realise it was something I was actually had a real interest in. Um, so yeah, I, I owe probably a lot of moving into this phase of my career. I think to to Steve, um, unfortunately, no longer with us. Yeah, interesting one. So um, I I worked full time for fourteen years at various different clubs and. Just before COVID, due to COVID, I was I was actually in the States, came back over um, and had a complete career change. So for reasons that I won't bore everyone in the room, but I um, I moved outside of football at that point. So I am now what's known as a client manager. So I do presentations for a technology company um, up and down the country. So yeah, 14 years football and now I work outside of it. And this is probably the bit where I can definitely put you to sleep. <laughs> put, put you to sleep and slip to the last slide and say thanks very much. Uh, so I work for a, um, a utility company, work for a, a water utility company. Um, I manage a large technology team. Um, so we provide sort of maintenance and project services across an operational technology base. <laughs> Uh, answering Dave's phone calls, <laughs> getting back to Dave's texts. Um, they are my main hobbies, what my missus would say outside of uh, work. But no, just um, play a bit of five aside, play a bit of snooker with friends, a bit of tennis, um, what the dog with, with the girlfriend. That's pretty much it for me, nothing exciting. Yeah, the same, unfortunately. I think um, having two full time jobs, because this is definitely a full time job. Uh, there's not much time for much else, so just family time with my daughter mainly, and yeah, more football text. Okay, so I'll just try and talk you through a little bit of detail around um, the the team and and some of the responsibilities and the things that we have to pick up on a um, on a weekly basis. So just just work our way across. So obviously, Tim, you just met. Got Jack Hawk, who's um first team coach. Jack is um fairly young in terms of getting into his coaching. He's been doing it for a number of years now, particularly at youth level, working for for Man United and Everton doing sort of the really young kids. Um really talented coach. Yeah, got probably quite a lot that he can he can learn from Tim. Um, but he's doing really, really well. I'm really pleased with how he's developing as a coach. And again, it, it it's similar to how we want to try and build a team. It's about having a good group of people as well. Um, Sam Ashton. So Sam's a, a very experienced goalkeeper in non-league. Um, Sam has played sort of conference <laughs> north level, so sort of step two level and down. And he's coming towards the end of his career at the start of the season, and that's where we sort of had a conversation with him and said, "Would you would you just like to start to bridge that gap now?" So he's our reserve goalkeeper and our goalkeeper coach as well. Uh, John and John, so if you want any kit, just shout John, one of them comes running. Um, it's the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that people don't see, and, and obviously it's one of the most vital parts of what we do. Looking the part and being the part of, of come hand in hand, so when the players go out on that pitch, they feel a million dollars with the kit that they've got, whether it's for training or games. And if you go to any professional club, generally speaking, the most liked person is always the kit man. And you look after people. Darren, so I'll take you through some of the stuff that Darren does. Um, Darren is the lead scout, so Darren will go and watch opposition games. 
from that he'll pull together a lot of the detail that will go into opposition reports so the players will get an understanding of the team that they're going to play against both at a general level in terms of the way that the team plays but also at an individual level so they'll get some detail around each player <coughs> Jimmy so this is probably I'm probably expecting a couple of questions on this so Jimmy's just come to the club now recently Jimmy's come in as a head of recruitment um, so his job is primarily focused on around identifying players um, who can come play for the football club, whether that be now or in future years as we start to hopefully emerge through the, through the leagues and through the structure. Chris, like I said, um, our lead analyst, so Chris will pull together a lot of the video clips from, from the VO, uh, from the footage, provide clips for players for their personal improvements, he does a lot of the analysis around the GPS stuff as well, which again I'll take you through a little bit later. Um, <laughs> and, and again, it's, a, it's probably a, a market where is ever increasing in terms of the game. So you'll see sort of five, ten years ago where clubs would have maybe one or two analysts. Now you've got sort of full teams, lead analysts, you've got opposition analysts, you've got lots and lots of detail going into that now. So that's a, an ever increasing area of, of, the, of the game going forward. And finally, we've got um, our sick notes, so our vets, we call them. So um, Alan and Aidan, who, who do a brilliant job, really, in keeping players on the pitch as much as physically possible. We have a rule that the, the physio makes the final decision. So obviously, Tim and I, are, our priority is always going to be three points on a Saturday, but the physio will generally have that player's sort of care in mind as well. So if the physio says no, then, then that's the final decision that we go with. <coughs> so, so this is like a, a really quick visual representation of what goes into a typical week. And I won't go through loads of detail and bore you with it. But basically, it's different contact points or touch points throughout the week in terms of some of the detail that we have to do. So if you work your way backwards from a game almost, obviously you've got your match day. Going into the match day, you've got to make sure that all the kit and equipment's right. You've got to make sure that we've got team talk, warm-up, set pieces, all the, all the tactical detail that goes into that is all in place. On the Friday, we'll name the squad. We'll make sure the opposition reports are out, game plans, all our plans are produced then. 24 hours in advance, GPS data from training, mm. opposition final report. So there's lots and lots of information that are being pulled together. That's obviously a representation of a one game week. So when there's two games, you're potentially almost doubling that amount of detail that we have to pull together. The reason why it's so in depth and got so much detail going into it is I think it's mine and Tim's job to make sure that we strive for those one percent. If we put that team on the pitch eight, seven, eight, nine times, it, they, they'll probably go and win the game anyway. But it's the difference between hopefully winning promotion and and just being a good team that finishes second or third, giving as many many one percent as we can, driving for that excellence and that that sort of striving for for success. So this is an example of an opposition report. So it's from, from the game. It's, this is a real report. So this is from, from the game that we played against the Elam on Saturday. That is, they, they are Elam's last six fixtures. So in there, you'll see that you'll get sort of a visual representation of the game they played against West Didsbury, what formation they played, who played where and what position. Who was on the bench, obviously scored and result. And then that's replicated across the six games. From that, it allows us to predict what we think the team might be coming into the game that we play. And then there's some detail around how the team plays. So some, some really key principles, like what they're like in possession, so with the ball out of possession and what they're like in the transition, transition, so both when they lose the ball or regain the ball. Threats and strengths, so what are they particularly good at? 
some weaknesses. So is there areas that where we feel we can exploit them tactically? And then some general information around set pieces. Sometimes that will be accompanied with uh, a video of, of a particular corner routine or a free kick routine if it's particularly um, something to look out for. <laughs> And then finally, we'll we'll give the players a little bit of a bio on each player. So again, it's just really high level detail and information around each player, what the name is, preferred foot, right foot, left foot position, the height, so we can try and match up on corners. And then a little bit of detail around what we've seen from watching that player two or three times in the past. What are the preferences? What type of things do you like to try and do? So the idea behind it is if Erlem have got a left winger who's right footed, we know we've watched him three times. He cuts inside on his right and tries to get a shot off. The idea behind it is now our right, right, right back knows what or can predict what that player is going to try and do more often than not. In terms of how we we work the opposition reports, obviously we try and create as as close to a full time environment as you can, but with the understanding that we only train twice a week. So there's certain sacrifices or things that you've got to try and do to try and manage that time. One of the things we'll try and do is where we've got contact time or where we can make most use out of the contact time is we'll try and find alternative ways. So this is a good example of it. So rather than spending 30 minutes on a 30 training doing a, an opposition brief or a tactical meeting, we'll put this the, the report into the WhatsApp group. So the lads all get that. We give the players accountability to then go and read that on a Friday night or on a Saturday morning when they're having a breakfast or whatever's their normal routine. And we give them those, that accountability. Um, the last thing any player wants on a Saturday is to listen to me talk about the lads in the dressing room next door. So the idea behind it is they've got access to that information. It's all there for them. It won't tell them everything, but it might give them that one piece of information that stops that one goal or allows us to score one goal, which might make a massive difference at the end of the season. You may have seen lads with, with GPS vests in. So again, it's another emerging sort of part of the game. It's about understanding what load people are doing on, in, a, in a regular week. So again, this is a game from, from Erlem. So if you look at some of the top numbers there in terms of Charlie and Jordan, covering 11 and a half kilometers in a game. So that they are phenomenal numbers for, for the level of football. And again, some of the stuff that Tim will talk to you about around our philosophy and style of play, some of this will probably feed into why we're seeing such big numbers in terms of the way that we want to play. There's the Stat Sports Vest give us 265 different measures so it it is literally endless. Now we don't pass all that to the players. We keep it quite short. I think it's about well six pages long. It is so it's just around some key metrics. So the, what what you can see it is total distance, high speed running. So it's how many meters they've covered at high speed, max speed, which is always everyone wants to know who's the fastest. That's like the that's the for the under tens who want to know. <laughs> Who's the, who's the fastest today? I think that Gaz must have been going downhill. 9.6. <laughs> so, and then another one that's quite interesting. So these two measures are dynamic stress load and fatigue index. So this is where it monitors the player's ability <clears throat> to perform at a consistent measure over a prolonged period of time. So the output of this will tell us potentially how much load, how much dynamic load has gone through that player in a single session. When we look at that over a three session or five session period, it may indicate to you potential injuries on the horizon. Also with fatigue index as well. So that again, it's a, it's a calculation that works in the background, but basically we'll, we'll be monitoring that. And for, you know, Ollie Jepson, and, and Andy Scarisbrick in, in this example, it might be where we go, we're, we're going to pull them out to train and give them a night off, or we're going to make sure that they spend a little bit more time with Alan and Aidan before they go into sessions. So again, it's about making sure that we're using data to keep the players on the pitch to ensure performance is optimal.
And then this is a, a standard sheet that we use on a Mac today. So it's providing generic information around whether we're going to play in a certain way or change something or there's a part of a game plan for a certain game. So this this one's actually from the Presswitch game. Um, and I think there's a there's a couple of areas to pull out. So one of, one of the things, obviously, when we did some analysis on the way that Presswitch play and some of the things that was being fed back to us from from players who know some of their players around, they were going to press us really high, they were going to take the ball off us early, they were going to run all over us, they were going to destroy us and and, and everything, all this, this was all the feedback we were getting. So on the day, it was about trying to change the way that we want to play. So rather than playing out from the back, it was miss that press out and play a little bit longer on the first contact and try and play up, up the further end of the pitch. I think you might actually see that in one of the, one of the stats later. But again, it's just it's to make sure that the messages that were given to the players is consistent. Right, everyone, we're going to get back underway with the second half. Um, but as was teased um, before the break, I mean, I can keep talking and then we'll just keep the tease going even more. Um, but I will uh, hand you back to Dave to uh, talk us through. Uh, the latest signing uh, before we get to your questions. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish! <laughs> there we go, there's our interviews. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Ollie's, Ollie's a young player. Um, he signed for us on loan from um, Oldham, so till the end of the season. Um, really, really good deal for us. Um, can play anywhere across the back line. Predominantly plays more now as a centre-back, but he can play right side, left side, or in midfield as well. So he covers a number of different positions. Technically really good, strong, physical and aggressive. Fits into a lot of the player profile stuff that Tim talked through before. And I think you'll all probably admit that one area of the pitch where we haven't had a lot of competition for places is at, is at, is at centre back. So obviously, recognised centre halves traditionally Tom Moore and Ollie Jepson. So this gives us a little bit more um, competition and hopefully strive and pushes those those players on as well. Um, Ollie was really highly thought of coming through. Um, watched him quite a few times playing for Man United as a youth player. He's had. He's broke his sick that one leg on two separate occasions, pretty bad breaks, which scuppered him getting his next pro deal at Man United. And then when he was at Oldham, um, he was on the brink of the first team and he went out to go on loan to Kersen to get some game time and he's ended up breaking his leg again. So he's he's had a tough time of it, but he's a he's a really, really good player and a really good addition for the group. Okay. Perfect. Right. Scary bit. <laughs> right, so we. Is it working? Right, um, we'll answer the questions. Um, Hello, there we go. I'll just shout. I'm good at that. Um, if anyone's listening to the goals commentary. Um, right, um, we'll go to the questions. Mark and Mark are around the room. If people want to put their hands up, then we will get going. We will go at the back with the red leather jacket first. Yeah, I'm Jamie, a uh, Black Furry fan. Um, yeah, my question is about sort of what you expect to the players in terms of looking after themselves when they're outside of the club. Um, sort of, you know, home physio, um, recovery, all the rest of it. Do I see that? Right away. Yeah, so I think in terms of the expectations of, of ourselves, it's probably quite high. So, again, we, we'll talk about the same sort, use the same sort of phrases. It's trying to replicate as much of a full time environment as we can. Tim mentioned it before, there's a lot of challenges in that in terms of we might have a match on a Tuesday evening, you no know, Withenshaw next week. Massive, massive game for us. Some of those players might have been sat behind the desk for eight hours in that day. 
Some of them might have been digging holes. Some of them might have been delivering mail. Might have been down the back of a, a U bend and a toilet. So there's a whole host of different challenges around making sure that people are looking after themselves. But whilst we want to try and drive standards, we firm believe in doing it through accountability. So if a player is accountable for their own performance, they know what drives their performance in terms of their performance envelope. How consistent can they be? A eight out of ten or a nine out of ten? And then based on the profile, what goes into that? So a Charlie Doyle, for example, yeah, he's covering eleven and a half k a game. So if he's not getting up and doing his normal routine where he goes for a run or goes to the gym or eats healthily, you'll see that quickly and it'll massively, massively impact his performance. That okay? Let's keep the hands raised. So we'll go over to the right hand side. Is there anyone there at the back there, Mark? <laughs> Uh, George wants to know. He wants to know: Is it hard managing Bury, and what is your favourite thing about managing Bury or coaching Bury? Obvious. <laughs> yeah, I th look, it's hard. I, I think again, going back to the level that we're, we're operating at, this is this is not a North West Counties club. Look, look at where you are now, and look at look out the window, and you can see it's a football league club. So that comes with pressure. It comes with with, with some stresses. It comes with a massive responsibility, f first and foremost, f for you guys and everybody else who supports the club. Um, it's very challenging trying to work alongside another full-time job, but the benefits and the rewards that come from it are massive. You know, and seeing so many people here today, working with those players, having chats with people around the room about their experiences of, of Bury and the football club and the disastrous time that people have had when it was taken away from them. I think trying to get into understanding how important the club it is to the, this local community and to each and every one of you, that's what makes you proud to try and be part of it. <clears throat> so that, for me, is the best thing. Sam? Yeah, I think um, I speak on behalf of the players as well. That We look forward to the home fixtures because of the crowd and the stadium so much. Um, reflected in the form a bit. So obviously some of the grounds that we're going to are are difficult um, in terms of the setups. So I think we've won every single game at home here and that's there's an extra layer of motivation when you come in here. Um, just because it's so special, it's so unique. Effectively, it's a League One, League Two club in non-league and none of the players and none of the staff take it for granted. So. OK, George. Shent <laughs> at the front here in the purple jumper. Hi, my name's Alex. Um, if you look at the players page in the programme, there's as many players that have left us as we've actually got in the squad at the moment. Um, was that a deliberate decision or is that just the way things panned out after you turned up? So I think there's a, there's a couple of different factors. I think at this level of football, there's always a high turnover of players. Um, majority of players are what's called non-contract, so it's just a an informal agreement where there's a registration between the club and the league on the player's behalf. That gives a player freedom of movement within a seven-day notice period, so a player can decide that they don't want to play for you anymore and they can either request to leave or another club can request to take them. So there's always a higher turnover than what you'd normally see in the EFL. There's no transfer windows, so you will see more general movements. I think the first four week, three, four weeks of when we were in, you you obviously seen a high turnover of players. Going back to some of the stuff that Tim highlighted, and I'm sure people have got questions around individuals, and, and this is more of a collective one. Everyone's opinion is going to be slightly different in football, but when you're going back to what some of the stuff that Tim was talking about earlier around profiles and identities, it's not about saying this player isn't a good footballer. It's about saying, do they suit this way that we want to play and our style of play going forward? And that player might go and play in a league above and be really good and be one of the better players in that position. But it doesn't mean that they can do the job that we want them to do. So it, it you know, it, it's very similar to doing another job in a, in a in a different industry outside of football. You might be really good at one element, but in another different employer, you're not quite as um, as on top of game. Anything to add there, Tim? Nope. 
Perfect. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, just on the front there, Mark's coming across with the microphone. Hi, Jeremy Clegg here. Uh, just touching on your previous answer about uh, being full-time and part-time, would either of you, or are either of you, striving to become full-time managers and coaches? Either, I, either at Bury or another club. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer this initially, then obviously Tim can add it. I think Tim's been there and done that. Um, I haven't. Um, it, it's a, it's a tough one. I think a, in a, in a dream world, I'd love to, to, to be in football full time. Obviously, there's a lot of other factors that are involved in that, um, around security and family. I've got a young family. I've got a mortgage to pay and. I've got a good job that I'd have to walk away from where I've got a career. If there was one club that would make me want to do it, it would be Bury. Um, I think it's the only club that you would potentially take that risk and take that gamble of financial security and walk away from a career job to, to take that on board. And only time will tell. I think, I'll be dead honest, I think what I'd love is to take us to the National League and then potentially hand over the reins to someone who's got more experience higher up the pyramid and can take the club forward. I know that I've played a part in, in the club's history getting back into the football league. That's the way I see it now, and I know you know that may change in time, but at the moment in time, I don't know. And that, that, that's just trying to be as honest as I can. Yeah. Um, you never say never, so... It if it was the right opportunity and it ticked certain boxes, I would definitely be open to it. Um, it's not something that I'm, I'm looking to do. It's not something, that, something that I really want to do. I think it's it's a much longer conversation, but um, been offered kind of several jobs, really league one, league two as assistant. And it's, it's just not a lifestyle at the moment that I want to do. I think there's a lot of risk attached to it. I've seen a lot of friends who have been in and lost the jobs and had to chase jobs around the country. Um, it's not just like, for example, now in my job that I'm doing outside of football as a business manager and a client manager, if I lost my job, there's hundreds of other jobs within commutable distance. I think for football, um, I've seen a lot of very close friends who've lost their jobs, been out of the jobs after six weeks because of bad results. Um, and they're, at, they're absolutely outstanding at what they do. And it probably wasn't a true reflection, but because it's a results-based business, um, it's just a very... Uh, insecure way of living to be honest so um, never say never always open to it but it would have to be tick certain boxes yeah just just add to that as well because it, it almost feels like that's quite an, a probably negative answer and I, I don't think that's the case I think the most important thing is that when Tim and I leave this football club whenever that may be that it's in a much better place than what it is now and it's handing over to somebody else who's even more capable and whether that be at the point we we're looking at full time, or whether it's after that point, I, that that that's obviously the future, and we just don't know. But I'm massively passionate about where we're going and what we're trying to achieve, and there will be an end to it at some point. There always is, but it's most important that whoever's the custodian of this football club is the right person. Let's keep the hands up, gentlemen at the back in the black jacket. Uh, I'm Tim. Uh, been coming here for a long time. Um, I was really impressed with the level of detail you go into, and I was quite surprised. Um, oh, sorry. Um, how does that differ from other clubs in our league? Would you say? Do you know? Uh, I would suggest it's probably more detailed than all. Um, different teams will have different elements that they might do. Some teams might do an opposition report and it might just be something that the, that the manager reads out before the game. It might be something that goes out on a WhatsApp in terms of just like text. Um, different teams value different things. And, and again, the, I'm not saying what we do is right. I'm not saying it's the only way. It's just our way. And it's something that works for us. I think it gives the players an, an element of detail so that they can be more accountable for their own performances. Um, and that's again really important to us that the lads have got that information available to them and do you know what being honest some of them probably don't read it 
some of them probably don't pay attention to it, but if they're turning up on a Saturday and they're being the best player on the pitch week in, week out, you sometimes you've got to hold your hands up. But yeah, it, I just think going back to what I said earlier, one percent most important thing, marginal improvement, anything that you can do to make yourself a little bit better. And if that means like last night driving to Lancaster or driving all over the place to watch games week after week when we're not training or we haven't got games ourselves, if only one of those provides us a piece of information that allows us to win one extra game, that could be the difference between 97 and 100 points. Felix, um, just with the signings, I was wondering, like, because of the name of the club and everything, has it been easier to sign the players that you want to sign? Do you know what I mean? Like, the sort of range of players, is it harder to find like, at Bootle than compared to Bury? Yeah. You know I mean? So, going back to Tim's question then, I think when we were at other clubs, our selling point outside of full-time was this... If you speak to a lot of players, and we used to get players to drop down a lot of levels was because of the way we do things and professional. Um, and hopefully if you speak to a lot of players, they would say it's the best outside of full time. I think obviously when you come to Bury, um, we still go into that detail, but the stadium and the club sells it really. Um, so we've got a lot of players that, in our opinion, will be very successful in the league above. Um, you don't get all of them. You don't get all of the players that you go for. Financial is really important to a lot of players. Uh, not a lot of players, some players, but... Um, Anything you want to add on that? Yeah, so there's a lot of draw to Bury because of because of the things that we're all well, well aware of. There's also a stigma around clubs like ourselves where we've got a big fan base where people are just going to get loads and loads of money and we've got to be competitive and we've, we've got a competitive budget but it's not going to match teams that are a league or two leagues above. So there's elements that you're looking for, very uniqueness in terms of criteria. So first and foremost, it's got to be the right player. We do background checks and understanding of whether it's the right person because the, the the group is more important than any individual player. And then there's obviously the other things that come around around what the player's ambitions are, what their priorities are, because priorities change throughout your career. You know, when you're young, you might be prepared to drive an hour to play footy because you've got no other commitments. When you get a little bit older, maybe you've got kids, you, you can't do that. So it's trying to knock off those sort of, sort of criteria and really focus in on some players. We've, we've been in for a number of players and we haven't managed to get them through the door um, for different reasons. So there's some cases that it, it you, like a conversation that literally, look, you know, we want to speak to you, like, where do you want me to sign? I'll do it now. And it's like, right, okay. And some have been really hard because, again, because of the expectations of what it is. And I'll be dead honest as well. I think we spoke to a couple of players where they haven't fancied the pressure because of everything that comes with it and they know that they can't handle that sort of pressure and expectation. One over in the far corner. Hi, um, I, I got a bit carried away a few weeks ago at Skem. <laughs> um, would we be prepared ever to change the way we, I think you've answered the question earlier on with the press which game, the way you went longer <coughs> to avoid the high press. I'm just wondering if you know, obviously I watched a lot of Oldham and Joe Royal in the sort of late 80s as well as obviously coming here. And if they could get three goals behind at times, and they'd basically play with four forwards, move their centre back up front. And I know times change, football's change, but sometimes I think that rudimentary game plan whips the crowd up when a side's, you know, one, two, three goals behind. And I saw them sort of pull back so many losing positions to win games. I just thought, well, I'd say the Skem game, which is the only game I could ever say, maybe I'd look at things a bit differently. Maybe with them conceding so many goals, we needed to get the ball in the box a little bit quicker that day. But like I say, brilliant presentation. Really impressed with everything you're doing. It's, uh, you know, it's just a personal viewpoint on that one. And I just wondered, if, uh, would you ever consider last 20 minutes, we're in a losing position just... You know, throw in the kitchen sink at it, sort of thing. I think I probably know the answer. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I, th I think we've probably seen it, haven't we? I think there's been a few games where we've been chasing the game and philosophy, tactics, all the nice words that Pep Guardiola uses and whatever. They they got the wind, and it's like, lump it, get up the pitch. But <laughs> yeah, that was probably me as well. Look and. 
I think the the idea behind it is you want to have a style and a brand of football. Everyone's going to play a different way. Everyone's going to have different opinions on the best way. But again, going back to what Tim was saying, it's around doing analysis of the way that teams that consistently win leagues, your Man Cities of the world, your Bayern, they, they always dominate the ball. Now there's going to be times in games where we do need to change that. We changed it against Presswich. It was a tough pitch. We knew what they were going to try and do. We want to take this thing out the game. Turned them early, got 1-0 up. Went in a half time, got the second goal, and it was just a case of closing shop and just trying to trying to be sensible with it. So, yes, there's always a time and a place, but we we really believe in the way that we want to play. We really, really believe in it. And if it was, yeah, and you're not going to see three hundred passes on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we're going to, to Remica on Saturday. It's possibly the worst pitch in the league and you're not going to see us complete four or 500 passes on Saturday. I can tell you that now. Um, but yeah, like I said, we, we strongly believe in the philosophy. We strongly believe in the way that we want to play. Um, the players are bought into it. It's what we hope fans want to see as well in terms of dominating the ball. Anything? Yeah, I think... Um, if you hear our conversations at 70 minutes, it's, it's never to draw a game. It's how do we go and win this? And I think obviously we've worked together that long that it's we're just constantly coming up with solutions how we win it. Um, one of the reasons we went to the 3 5 2 is that can we get two? Can we create that 2v2 two two against two centre backs? Can we get the wing backs on? So basically, can we get a 4v4 on the highest line? so that we've got that option of playing a bit more direct if we want. Um, I, th I think the changing system allows us to dominate the ball and create the free play, but it also allows us to create a 4v4 high and cause problems and make the defence constantly make decisions a bit more. Whereas when we were 4-3-3, it was very much centre-back was 2v1 against our striker. It was hard for us to get our full-backs high enough. Um, so I think when you start coming to this period of the year now, when the pitches get really bad and like Dave said, this is terrible on Saturday. Um, we don't want to change what we're doing, but we will adapt to win a game, yeah. Has it been hugely beneficial uh, for players that are regular bar injuries in your match day squad? Uh, was signed by the previous manager. Uh, Gaz Pete's exceptional. Andy Briggs has been an absolute workhorse for the team. Connor Comer was signed by Andy Welsh, uh, probably from leagues lower than we were at. And Benito Law, would there be four players that you personally would have brought into the club if they were available? Good question. Um, I think a, a lot would have depend on the circumstances as well at the time, but all four players are, are in the plans. All four players are playing. Like I said, we, we have had a, a turnover of players. Those four players are here. I think they're adding massive value to the group. First and foremost, they're really, really good lads. So they fit into the philosophy of what we're trying to create in terms of that bond within the group. That changing room downstairs is worth 10 points. So the brilliant brilliant people, really, really good players. They've got the, their own strengths and weaknesses. They fit in with the new players that have come in to the group. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying work with all four and I couldn't care less who signed them. <laughs> you know, at this level, you look at people like Benito Law and the guy is just such a fan's favourite. For such a lad, maybe in his mid twenties, you know you can tell he's had issues with injuries, but you know he looks like he actually is thriving on playing for the club as a floor player, <coughs> and he probably can be used behind the front two, can't he? Because he's, you know, early in the season, some of the goals that he scored were beyond this level of football. Yeah. Benito's a very intelligent footballer, so he's a player who can 
drop in to space, his time into arrive into space is really important. He tends to receive the ball in a way that allows him to open up to play so he can play forward. So that those type of skills naturally fit as a number 10 position, if you like, or as a, a striker dropping in. So, yeah, I think you're right, Benito. He's got that character that, that enjoys plays in front of the crowd. He likes to be the villain with the opposition and he likes to be the hero with you. And you can see him playing those both parts at the same time and he flits between one and the other and when he's flicking someone where he shouldn't be, next minute he's celebrating in front of the fans. And, and that's, that's part of his character. And like I said before, when we're talking about recruitment, people think you just go and I watch a player play once and identify him going, oh, he's better than what we've got, we'll go and sign him. It's not that simple. Um, and Benito's a really good example of that. Of if he went and played for another team in this league, I don't think you'd see the return on his numbers in terms of the goals scored and whatever. Our, chal- our only challenge with Benito is getting him on the pitch. Two questions at the back. We'll go back then. We'll go to the back row and then come to the front row. Cheers. Um, it's Rob Black. How much do you look at... So you just talked about the, the um, dressing room downstairs being left hand players. How much, when you're looking at a player, do you look at the cultural fit of how they're going to fit within the team as well as how good they are? In every other industry, when you're looking at people, that's a massive thing when you're building a team. So is that the same in football as it is in your careers? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's massive. And and again, I think what you've probably seen today is that we, we, we do go into a lot of detail. So... I'd like to think that we do more checks and balances than, than most other people. When we're, we're, we've identified a player, generally speaking, it's based on his ability on the pitch, first and foremost. So it's through a scout or through word of mouth or a player that you may be seeing a few times before. But there's al- that always is, is always followed up with two, three, four conversations with previous managers, teammates, players who we trust who've played with this player or being coached by this player or whatever it is, but it's always about trying to do those background checks to understand that as much as we've you know, sat here patting ourselves on the back around the last 11 games and that the performances have been really good and the results have been good, one bad apple in that group can change that pretty quickly. So it's for me, it's I'm, I'm a people manager. Tim Tim's a, an unbelievable coach. Getting the right people through the door is the most important over the over the player. I'll go just in. There we go. Hi. Uh, before the break, there was a stat on the board, and eight percent, I think it was, strikes per goal. Can you just touch on that for us. Yeah. So it, that's a large part of that, I think, of games and the period that. I tried to erase it from memory. A period around the Skem game where we were averaging something around 20 shots on goal per game. And I think that was one of the reasons that, that sort of moved us towards the change of shape. So the conversion rate of chances we were creating was really low. So it was a concern. It's something we sat down and talked hours on end around how we resolve it. And the the best way we thought was was around the change of shape and getting two strikers up there. Um, <clears throat> on the flip side, the other way to look at it is, and a lot of the things that we try and do around coaching, what Tim will build the sessions around, is, is some of those stats and performance measures. So if we are creating chances and having 20 shots on goal in a game, <clears throat> but scoring one or 0.8 then it would suggest that we need to work on final third in training. So it's final third entries, it's around movements, it's intricate pet play, finishing, <laughs> clearly. But it, it almost allows you to address which part of the pitch you need to work on. If we've only scored in 0.8 or, or one goal a game and we're only creating one chance, then the area's a little bit further back that we need to work on. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions? We'll go to Sue first, then we'll come one, two, three. First of all, really interesting, absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you. I'm just thinking about George and some of the youngsters who are so keen to engage with the players. Gaz Peters is a real role model at the end of the game. 
of doing that. I just wonder if we can perhaps push a little bit more for that engagement, pitch side, over by the south stand, just with the uh, end of the game with the players and signatures and that sort of thing. Yeah. It's, there's a big demand now. Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's a fair request. That I think the the if I'm being honest, there's probably an element of a bit a little bit uncomfortable. Mm. You remember the, these lads? All of a sudden, they've yeah. got fans, and it's like it, I know that sounds stupid, but like, well, I've never had a fan before. I've never had a song. Someone's singing about me. So th there is an element of like sometimes it's not it's not that they don't want to come over and engage. Some of them are quite shy. Like using Gaz as a role model, yeah, he will do because you can see that. I mean, I'm I'm usually helping down that end, and the kids are wanting to. You'll shout to a player to come and speak, and I can see that they're not comfortable with it. It's exactly that. It's perhaps we had a, a bit at the beginning of the year when we had a coaching session, the open coaching session, and that very much engaged the, the kids with the players. And whether we, I know we've got priorities. But whether that's something to look at, perhaps to look more towards the end of the season, and just to get everybody comfortable with it. Totally take your point, and you can see that happening. They're standing yeah. back, the kids are standing back, but it's a really important part of growing the brand, really, and moving it. Forward. Yeah. So I'll mention it to the players this week. I think it'll be it'll be good to try and get a response for that on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it, it it's a fair request. I think it's important that we have that sort of contact time so that people <coughs> are you know sort of feel part of it as well and. Like I said, it, they're, very loved, very loved, they're very loved. Some of them are very shy. I've been yeah. working with Andy Scarisbrick for five years. When he heard them say three words, <laughs> <laughs> not so, a fan of an interviewer. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, not the best on the interviews, but yeah, we'll we'll try and make sure that happens. I'm Craig. Um, Craig. Just a little bit of starting formation. Um, the formation that we've got now um, is that what we're looking at. So I'm just looking at, uh, obviously, the new player coming in, obviously looking at what he's been, what he's done, he's going to be in the first team. And he's looking forward to being there quite soon, so that's going to change. Yeah. Um, so that you better stand for God, looking in. And he wants to have the left wing back side because of the lack of left footers. Yeah. yeah, so I, th I think the idea around squad building is, <clears throat> depending on what you're looking for at the time, in an ideal world, I think where we are, we're always striving to improve. So it's about trying to bring in players who you expect to come in and play. Will that always happen? No, because performances will always differ. And like you said, we've just had a solid sort of defensive performance over the last few games. Um, Gaz can play as a left wing back. Um, I think he'd be very competent there. That would allow, obviously, another central defender. But we were going into a game... Was it last Saturday against Earlham? And we had a, a bit of a scare on Thursday night with Tom Moore. So he felt his, his car sort of pull a little bit on a train on Thursday. Aidan and Alan were working on a Thursday night, Friday, Saturday morning. And he got a couple of rubs and he miraculously, after one of the rubs, it just felt okay. But what we don't want is any single point of failure. Will you miss a player like Tom Moore? Of course you will. But if Tom Moore wasn't available for Saturday, we've got two options. We either play someone massively out of position in a key area or you change your shape. We're not adverse to changing shape, but it should be for the reasons that we, you think it'll be more beneficial to win that game rather than because your recruitment hasn't allowed you to have that player. So you need to have competition. Is there anything worth adding to that? Is that answer it? You want to know the team for Saturday? But not all it was, I was looking up because we are sort of short on the left footed players. We are short on the left footed players, so um, obviously we've got a new recruitment in Jimmy. Uh, is he going to be out there looking for left sided players for us? Exactly that. So Jimmy is looking for left, a left sided player. 
I think if you look at, we've had a little bit unfortunate with with um, with Andy Kells. Um, he's obviously injured at the moment, so he'll be back probably in the next week or two. Um, that gives you a little bit more balance again. Um, we would have probably switched to a back three a lot earlier, potentially from the start, if we could have identified a left-footed centre-back. Um, I had some initial conversation with Gaz a while back, and Gaz was saying, I've never played there, I don't think I can do it. Um, I'll tell you now, left-footed centre-halves are like unicorns. <laughs> they do not exist. There isn't any six-foot-three left-footed players in the world. Um, yeah. So it, 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 it's something that's, that you, you do spend a lot of time because balance is really important to, to the shape that you're trying to play. But yeah, it, it's identifying them, throwing them in your boot and bringing them here. <laughs> that, that's a challenge. Final question to Jeremy. Uh, two, two questions, really, if I'm allowed. <laughs> Go uh, on, man. What, one's, one's on player. There's, uh, and the other one's on pitch, but player-wise, there's uh, a couple of players, Andy Hollins uh, and uh, Killiffin. Uh, could you give us a, a, a brief outline on where they are, what they're doing, and <coughs> right, where they fit in or they don't? <coughs> yeah. uh, Benito, injury-wise, when do we expect him back? Th that's on the player side. On the pitch side, totally different. If you were given the, the choice, everything else being equal, out there next season, would you go for a plastic pitch or a grass pitch? Everything else being equal. Forget about the economy and all the rest of it. Good question. Right, so I'll, I'll, if I can still remember, I'll try the first one. <laughs> um, so, Andy Hollins, he suffered with an MCL, was it? MCL injury going back probably about 18 months ago um, when he was playing for Garsley. Oh, no, it was Marine. He just signed for Marine. Suffered an MCL injury. Quite often with those type of injuries, it, you get a decision or you get an option from a surgeon to say, do you want surgery or do you want to try and rehab it with their preferred option? At the time, Andy was told he, there was enough intact that he should probably try and rehab it. So I think he's probably played a handful of games since then as well as obviously going through pre-season, it's never quite felt right. And he's got to the point now where he was coming back, he had one full contact training session, and he just said, it, it's just not right. So we're in the process of getting a second review from a, from a orthopaedic surgeon. But it's looking likely that he's going to need an operation and probably won't play for um, six to 12 months. Tough. It, it's really tough because I, I think initially went down, obviously th going through the NHS and and whatever else. I, the way that they look at players and for the level of football we're at, it's do you need to have the operation to get through your normal daily life, walking up and downstairs, playing with your kids, going to the shops, going to work? Probably not. But obviously his passion's playing football, so he's been really unfortunate. But. Again, he's a good lad and he'll get support from, from himself and Tim and Alan. Alan's been brilliant trying to put him in touch with the right people. So I think Andy, we probably won't see Andy, uh, uh, certainly this season. Um, he'll probably be looking at about, around about 12 months. Benito. Um, Benito's got like a reoccurring sort of little calf problem and what we're really conscious of is next time Benito comes back, he's got to, we've got, he's got his challenges to stay fit till the end of the season. So if that means we need to be a little bit more cautious and give him an extra week or two, then that's what where, the, where Alan and Aidan are taking us towards. He's had some really good progress in some weeks, and then the next week he's almost gone back a little bit of a step. Um, I think it might have been Saturday. He, he turned up and he, he had a load of bruising where his calf had been sore. So some maybe some hematomas that have been broken up with, with a little bit of physio work and stuff. So... We're desperate to get him back in. You know, if he was fit, he'd be in the squad Saturday. There's, there's no doubt about that. But again, f for him and some of the struggles he's had in the past from a mental side, I think he, he's missing football. So we don't want to make we want to make sure that he gets back playing as soon as we can. Was it who else was there? Pitch. Oh, Clifford. So uh, Tom uh, is now at Lancaster. So 
Tom was again another player that he came. He was injured when we came in. He came to a training session. I think it was his second session, reoccurring to the same injury. Um, again, I think it was a calf as well. Um, he then had another two, three weeks out, came back again and did it straight away in the warm up. Um, at the time, he told me that he was going to probably pack in and retire. He lived in Lancaster, so you're talking about maybe an hour's drive, um, particularly around sort of those sort of traffic times for for training. Um, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't really know why he signed for Lancaster. To be honest, he hasn't played many games. He's been on the bench quite a bit, or not in the squad. But yeah, it was a surprise to see him crop up because he told me he was going to pack in. Pitch, um, it's a tough one. So, sort of an an old school view. Like there's nothing better than seeing a nice striped up grass pitch, and you walk out and it's just being nice and cut four different ways, and you know, oh, you want to roll around on it a little bit, a bit, weird, a bit weird like that. But there's nothing better than than that, and and obviously the spectacle that, that brings and and playing on grass. And my knees certainly wouldn't take playing on AstroTurf, but I think at this moment I'd probably sway towards um, an artificial surface for. The reason that it allows you to make sure that the games are on, and secondly, I think to have a base where you could train as well as play would be advantageous because look at the facilities we've got. So having the players here three times a week, um, or two depending if we're home or away, where you've got access to change rooms, showers, you've got, like I said, a lot of the stuff that we do before coaching, we'll sometimes do a video video analysis so that players can see what. The coaching session is we're trying to deliver on the pitch, so it's more efficient when we're when we're delivering coaching sessions. We can do video work, we can talk to them after it. There's meeting room spaces, so it this facility is basically gives us everything that that we would ever want. So I'd probably err on that side just because of everything else it brings. But I still love a nice grass pitch as well. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Tim. Um, I would absolutely love an Astro pitch out there. I think um, <clears throat> it's just incredibly inspiring for the players to come and train here. Firstly, you get the dimensions of what you play on at home. Secondly, in terms of recruitment and everything that we do. At the minute, the club have done everything possible, but we're at a public facility, so you can only set up when that team's come off um, to be able to bleed your home ground and be able to do the video work, have conversations with players. I'd I would love for us to do that, and like Dave said, getting the games on consistently. In this league, you, you constantly, not not as much at home, but you're constantly questioning whether the game's going to be on at this time of year. So as many games as possible where you know you can get a run at home. Um, it's not as bad in the league above. There's better, there's better pitches, but um, I would love to train here, yeah. I think what we really need, I don't know if you've seen the Bernabeu, Real Madrid. <laughs> what we really need is a nice grass pitch that we can play on on a Saturday and it slides out and underneath and a 3G. So we've got a bit of a... There you go, Marcel. We, we've got a bucket at the back. <laughs> so if anyone's got any spare change, there's a bucket at the back and we're about a, a billion pound away. Perfect. Well, uh, great attendance here tonight. I'm sure Dave and Tim um, will do these. Um, in the future, let's give them a, a big round of applause for being up there. <laughs> Wednesday night. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see another three points at Litherland on Saturday. <laughs>